Well, thank you very much for those that uh, stayed. My name is Bob Livingston. Just a little background. Been married uh, almost 30 years to a beautiful woman, Laura Ann Hobbs. And when I talk about some of the things in our family, let me make sure I acknowledge the uh, important role Mum played, who's not here today in all this. Uh, we have four children, Michael, Ted, Blair, and Jack. We're very blessed. The Lord has been extremely gracious to us over the last three weeks. Michael, uh, our oldest son, graduates from medical school this year, got his first choice, residential surgery in London, Ontario, where his wife is at University of Western Ontario. Um, there was over 65 applicants for five jobs, and the stress to get into medical school is nothing compared to the matching of where you do your residency. Our second son, Ted, for those that remember from my first talk, is our uh, entrepreneur. He started his own company called Kick, and about a month ago, he raised $8 million in venture capital financing, which is an unbelievable accomplishment on his part. These are three VCs out of New York, two out of New York, one out of Boston. It's the first Canadian investment they've ever made, and one of the gentlemen, Fred Wilson, is known as the papa of the VC field. He is the go-to guy. So he is joining Ted on his board. So amazing accomplishment. Blair having a great time in Germany right now. He's on the co-op program. I'm going to see him next Friday for a week and then Laurel will go a couple of weeks later to visit with him. So we've been very blessed there. And those that know me, young Jack, our fourth son, will turn 18 this August. Unfortunately, he had a stroke in the pregnancy and requires 24-hour care, but I can tell you, I reflected upon this yesterday, Jack has opened a part of our hearts, each one of us, in a different way that only through a process like that can you truly appreciate it. Now, I did want to say, as I was sitting there and uh, getting ready to come up, I want this presentation today to be for someone very special for me, and that's Bill Raycroft. I want to dedicate it to him, who's a grandfather, and I want to dedicate it to Mary Audrey. God bless you both. Your grandparents, both in the uh, spiritual and in the, I guess, the real. Now, today's talk. Today's talk is, uh, it's my second of three papers that I'm writing. The most exciting thing for me is, by having to get up here and talk to you people, it actually takes my papers to a whole new level. I get to rewrite them, think about them, I tape them, I listen to them in the car, I don't understand it, etc., etc. I really do enjoy the process. This is the second of three papers. The last paper I will be delivering here will be um, Leaving a Legacy. And it is a third paper that I'll be writing. It's almost finished. The last chapter will be written this week. And uh, it's going to be a very, very powerful paper in the philanthropy area. So I do this. I should also say I've been in the wealth management business for around 50 years. And you're going to say, my, he shows his age quite well. Well, my father started when I was four years old. And uh, so it's actually 54 years, let's not cheat here. I think wealth management is an extremely important skill set that a lot of people just never get taught properly. There's nothing magic to it. There really is not. It's just like most things in life. It requires a decision, a commitment, hard work, discipline, patience, and a little luck. And that's about it. So hopefully today's message I can share with you some ideas. I also became very exposed to something called personal development. Jim Rohn, John Maxwell, these are very powerful Christian men who I say, not always with John, he sometimes comes in through the front door, but Jim Rohn, great, great guy, he, um, he always came in through the side door as a Christian. And uh, he had a Christian message without wearing a Christian hat necessarily in terms of his professional job. And he had a passion for all this. So today's talk is called The Incredible Journey. It's a paper I wrote for grandparents and their grandchildren. And I'm gonna say right off the bat, I'm qualified on neither front. All my grandparents are dead, so I guess technically I'm no longer a grandchild, and I've never been a grandparent. But fortunately, I saw some pretty good ones out there. I'm gonna share with you some ideas. I'm gonna be a little judgmental, perhaps, a little straightforward. You can take it, you can leave it, but I hope you reflect upon it. I've made uh, handouts available at the front, two-page handout. It's got the summary of the presentation. When the crew gets back from Mexico, we'll put it on the website. The full paper's available along with the, uh, the other ones that I've written. I'm going to give you a quick synopsis of the, uh, of the introduction of the paper. Really, the way I look at it is this. I believe uh, parents have an extremely important role to be a disciplinarian and a mentor. 
and that's it. Obviously, there's a spiritual side too, but when it comes to their roles, I feel it's very important that they be the disciplinarian and, and a mentor. I call it a parent in control and a friend on call. And the reality is parents at times cannot be both. It's tough to be a disciplinarian and try to be a mentor at the same time. Your audience, i.e. your children, don't receive it. This is why I think grandparents have a uniquely important role in the family. Because they are not meant to be the disciplinarian in case they think otherwise. They are meant to be a friend on call. They are meant to be the mentor. And they have a wealth of experience. I don't mean just financial wealth. I mean they've laughed, they've cried, they've gone through their wins, they've gone through their losses. They've had successes and failures, etc. And really the true decision is, of all, the common theme in all my papers is there comes a time when we have to take personal responsibility for the choices we make. And when we make a choice, it requires a decision. And when we make that decision, it requires a commitment. And that commitment is pretty simple. It requires a plan, hard work, discipline, and patience. That's it. I mean, it's no more complicated than that. So what are grandparents supposed to do in all this? I think they have to understand what their role is. I think they have to understand their audience. I think they have to work with their children. I think they have to understand that they do have a wealth of experience that they can share if they so choose. So the first decision to make is when your first grandchild is born, putting it bluntly, am I in the game or not? Now, some people do not want to be a good grandparent. I think that's their loss, but that's their decision. At least they've made a decision. The worst one is they want to be a good grandparent and they kid themselves that they are. They make no commitment, they make no decision, they don't understand their process, they've never sat down and worked through it. And that's what I hope to share with you today. And probably no grand, well there might be one grandchild in the audience. I'm going to uh, share with you five ways that you can spend, that your grandparents can spend some money on you to help sow values into you for the long term. So let me open up with a video clip. That's my father and Michael, our eldest son, 1986. Yeah. Oh, there he is. There he is. Yes. There. 22 years later. Same Michael. My father, unfortunately, passed away. Michael Levinson. That's something called the white coat ceremony when you go in for your first year of medical school. It's a very, very moving ceremony. I don't have time to go through it with you today. But uh, my father would have been so blessed to have his grandson there. So what I'm going to do is talk about a quick overview of the first paper I presented, A Tale of Two Cities, a city called Entitlement and a city called Responsibility. I'm going to talk about the times they are changing, Bob Dylan, 1962, but the times are changing and grandparents have to recognize the changes taking place. It's time to get back to the basics, it's getting started for the grandchildren and getting started for the grandparents and then conclude with achieving significance. A Tale of Two Cities. Now Mary Audrey maybe have gone, I'm going to give her a clue. The new way of presenting is PowerPoint is out, Keynote is in and you never use bullets. Steve Jobs. Because if you have bullets up there, they're looking at the slide, not at you. So, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Probably next to the opening quote in the Bible, it's the most famous expression known in the English language. It is the best of times, it's the worst of times. I talked about two cities, a city called entitlement and a city called responsibility. Clearly, parents and grandparents want their children to go to a city called responsibility. The question is how to best help them get there. I talked about the journey, I talked about the characteristics of those living in the two cities, and lastly I talked about the rewards and the risks for living in the two cities. A city called responsibility, the characteristics of those living there. They have good established values. They can manage their finances well, they've achieved financial independence, which means a good work ethic and they understand how to manage their expenses. And they are good listeners. They care about people, they have an empathy. Very, very important. That's a city called responsibility. The rewards. They tend to be good parents. They tend to achieve financial independence. They tend to find good jobs. 
they don't have an inflated opinion on themselves. They have a servant mentality. They actually fit in well. They actually find what I call uh, career hobbies, professional hobbies, something they passionately enjoy doing. Like I define success very simply. Discover your passion, commit to be the best you can be at it, and share it with others. It's no more complicated than that. I think we make things far too complicated sometimes. And this is the big challenge for parents and grandparents. You must allow that younger generation to find their passion, not what you think their passion should be. We can steer a little, but you can't control. The way I put it to my father one day, I said, Dad, you can tell us once in love, the second time you're moving into control. So you better get the first one right. You only get one shot. And I've been practicing a little with my kids on this. Still got a lot of work to do. A city called entitlement. Quite the opposite, of course. They don't have well-established values. They don't achieve financial independence. And quite frankly, they're just quite selfish. It's all about me. When it comes to the workforce, they never really find a job that reflects, quote unquote, their ability because they perceive their ability as far higher than anybody else does. They never really accomplish a good job. They never are happy. They're always blaming it on somebody else. So clearly we don't want our kids or grandchildren in a city called entitlement. The times they are changing. Bob Dylan, 1964. Here's a quote, change is the only constant. Now it's not even in my paper and it's not even in my speech, but I'm gonna give a little confession here. I was out with my wife Laurel one night, we were at a marriage counseling course with a number of other people and they somehow, there was a question about change and I said, I hate change. Well, I've changed, so to speak. I think you can't hate change because it's a fact of life. Times are changing. They're changing constantly. And it's how you deal with change that determines who you are and who you become. If you sit there and say, I don't want to change, the world is going to pass you by and you're going to be a very disgruntled individual. As I say, now listen, my mother might not have to go at 87 years old, put her name on Facebook, but maybe her son should. One of the things I say to grandparents, if you want a truly meaningful conversation with them, you better learn their language. They got lots of things to do. One of them is not humoring you. Because they, you can learn a lot from their language too. I mean, God bless my wife, this is not an advertisement, but God bless my wife, she just got an Android phone, which I'm just waiting, I'm trying to explain to her the keyboard's a little hard to type on, but that's a whole other story. But. The first one she signed up, Ted Livingston at kick.com. And if I can get John's cell phone, I will get him on Laurel's kick messenger service too. And then she'll at least have two and Ted won't be bothered all the time by her. John will have to, yeah. Um, but it's time to, uh, to learn that we have to learn how to deal with change. And I think the other thing that's very important here is my personal reflection over the last 40 years, went to university in 1971, we're in 2011. What three major changes have I seen take place in those 40 years? Well, the first one is the low-hanging fruit is gone. Whatever field you're going into, it's competitive. There's no things like, well, I don't want to work summer, so I'll become a teacher. That was sort of the mentality back in 1971. I could remember graduating in 1976 from MBA I had four job offers, a week later I had four, four job meetings, uh, interviews rather, and a week later I had four job offers. And if you didn't get multiple offers, you were viewed as a bit of a loser. It's not that way anymore. So clearly the low hanging fruit is either gone or has been dramatically relocated. And what that means is the traditional model of going to university, four years, getting good marks, walking out the door and think you're getting a job, go talk to the graduates. It doesn't work that way. And I know that because I see what my kids are doing, how they're competing in today's world. I think the second major change is the way we communicate. Now, come on. Twitter, Facebook, internet, texting, kick, SMS. A lot of this stuff didn't exist 10, 15 years ago. I can remember when Michael went to university in 2002, he didn't even care about a cell phone. Three years later, it changed. Ted wanted a cell phone. But I think it's so important that, that we sit back and just think about this for a minute. The way we communicate is getting more and more based on technical communication. Very tough to read a heart as you text message them. 
So traditional relationships are based on good communication skills. This is going to be a big challenge for this generation coming up, I believe. So that has been a second major change. And the third one, not always as my sister points out, but clearly there's a sense of entitlement that our generation did not seem to have. And I'm afraid to say there's a, a sense of responsibility in the younger generation that our parents did not have. So they're going to, they have to deal with these issues. So this is why I talk about the two different cities. Back to the basics. Knowledge without wisdom is a load of books on the back of an ass. And I read this quote, and as Mary Audrey would say, I unpacked it a bit. Knowledge. Knowledge is a commodity. It's called Google. It's access to everybody. There's no, per there's no value added in Googling. We all can do it. You get paid when you add value added, whatever you're doing in life. It's the wisdom. That's the scarce commodity. Knowledge, there's lots of it around. It's the wisdom. So I think what we have to do here is go back to the basics. I think we have to stand back and look at five different things. I think, first of all, we have to define success. What is success? We have to deal with failure. We have to learn how to deal with failure. We have to help our next generation discover their passion. Here are some goals for the grandchildren and the role of grandparents. So first of all, defining success. I said it earlier, I define success quite simply. Discover your passion, commit to be the best you can be at it, and share it with others. No more complicated than that. So the most important role parents and grandparents have is helping their children discover their passion. Matter of fact, I achieve significance, I define significance as follows. Help others to discover their passion, commit the resources so they can be the best they can be at it, and encourage them to share it with others. It's not complicated. I think we make things far too complicated. By the way, my definition for success for my kids about 10 years ago, give or take, I want them to have what I have plus 10%. I want them to have a golf membership that I have. I want them to work downtown like I do. I want them to make a salary this so they can live in Lawrence Park two blocks from me, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Wrong. Well, my kids sort of have told me that. Wrong. You know what? The one common theme with Michael, Ted, and Blair, and in his own way, Jack, they've all discovered their passion. They are committing to be the best they can be at it. All in different fields. Michael's a doctor. Ted's an entrepreneur. <laughs> I got I got Well, I'll tell you a funny story, actually, just as an aside. I mean, this is a real passion for me, just watching these kids doing their thing, and I, I, I just love it. I was out for dinner with Ted, and one of his people walked by the table, one of his, you know, programmers, and he was there with his brother and sister and father. And his sister was around 12 years old. And he introduced me and they went off. It was a Swiss chalet. When I take Ted out for Swiss chalet and when Laurel goes down, it's never Swiss chalet, I can assure you. It doesn't cut it. Anyways, we uh, were sitting there talking and all of a sudden, a couple of minutes later, this young girl, 12 year old, came up to the table and she said, uh, Mr. Livingston, she was talking to Ted, not me. If there's a movie, can I be in it? the social contract, Canada style. You never know. Um, so dealing with the success is so, so important, how we define success. I think parents have to understand how they define success for their children, and they have to tell the grandparents, because it's not for the grandparents to define success for the children. And ultimately, it's not even for the, children, for the parents to do it. You have to let go. But let's face it, you have a, a responsibility to a certain age to help them what you perceive as success, but stand back and really think how you define it. Secondly, dealing with failure. You know, they say there's only two things that we always know in life will occur are taxes and death. And I would add a third one, disappointments. Everybody's going to have a disappointment. Everybody. And nobody can set their bar that low. And the disappointment will come because of people who either lead us astray or let us down from corporations that their agenda is more important than our agenda or just an event called you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, otherwise known as bad luck. And I think we somehow have raised a, a, a generation that failure is something that we must avoid. No, I think actually quite the opposite. If you don't fail, you're not taking enough risk. You're not growing. And that, that's the only way you're gonna discover your passion. We'll talk about that in a minute, but you've got to be able to take risk and you've got to learn that failure 
is an important part of your development process. Because once you can work, you, you fail for one of two reasons. You either fail because you genuinely made a mistake, which case, learn from the mistake. I had one of those this morning, I haven't got time to share it with you, but I learned from the mistake. Or you ran into adversity. The U.S. hockey team did not fail. They ran into Sidney Crosby. They can't walk away. There was a, it'll be a growing experience for them. So that's what I'm saying. Either a learning experience if you fail because you made a mistake, or a growing experience because you ran into adversity. But we must not, we must, the key is we must be there for our children and grandchildren called time when they fail to help them understand why they failed and most importantly what they can learn from it. The third one is discover your passion. Now, far easier said than done. It doesn't exactly grow on trees. But you have to have an open mind and be willing to take some risk. The way I put it is you must be constantly expanding your comfort zone while at the same time stretching your skill set. Now, John Maxwell, I'll give him full credit. He said, I will not be an opera, well, he didn't say it to me, he said it about himself. I will not be an opera singer. I'm a two out of 10. So the way I put it is, if you're a two out of 10 of something, forget it. Leave it for another day, another life, whatever. Take your sixes and sevens where you've actually some skills to take them up to eight, nines, or tens. But like, leave the twos alone. Other than my golf game, that's, I'm a two and I'm still working to try to get up there. The goals for the grandchildren. Two goals, very simple. Establish your values and achieve financial independence. Establish your values and achieve financial independence. It's very interesting. I talked about, um, in one of my papers, my core values. And I think everybody would say integrity is their top of the list. They'll either say it because they believe it or they think it's politically the right thing to say. But integrity is sort of an easy one, right? But I was at a Christmas dinner party with our family and I sort of went around, did a little survey trying to find, well, what are your core values? I'm not trying to embarrass anybody here, but you know, somebody said marriage. Well, I mean, marriage is good, but it's not a value. It's a result of a value, right? I'm committed to marriage too, but it's not a value behind to make marriage. It's a destination, a value, sort of part of the journey. And the way, the two, three I came up with are integrity, respect for others, and responsibility for myself. And the central theme in my paper, if grandparents can sort of figure it out, that their wealth can be used to teach all three, you are on your way. Because if all you do is spend money on your grandchildren, because you feel a little guilty or you feel a little want in your heart, this might help you. All your, and then you leave them some money in an inheritance. Money will only fulfill a need. When you leave your values, it will help them achieve their goals. And when you leave them some money and your values, it will help them achieve their dreams. Now, which one would you want? Fulfill a need or achieve a dream? I'd go for the dream myself. But the key is, you've got to take the time to teach them. And you've got the money. Any negotiation I ever involved in, the power hand usually goes to the one with the money. Now, I don't mean the arrogance on that, and I'm not suggesting grandparents, every time they give something to their kid, they have to go through a checklist. You're allowed to be a grandparent. You're allowed just to do it for the sake of doing it. But the way I put it, Lego sets will come and go. But Galatians 5.22 is here forever. Right? integrity, etc. And the role of grandparents. I've talked around it. The role of grandparents, quite frankly, I think is quite simple. Are you in the game or not? And our children have been blessed with two extraordinary people as grandparents. My father and my mother-in-law. It's not that the other two were not good grandparents, but these two took it to a level. Um, and I'll share with you a, a letter that my son Reich, Michael wrote to dad about a month before he died. I think it's so important that I, I said at my father's funeral when I spoke, I said when his first grandchild was born, dad sat down just like when he was president of Eaton Bay Financial or vice president, senior vice president of New York Life. He said the same thing. He didn't write it out, but he came to the decision, I will be the best grandparent I possibly can be, and I'm going to work at it. I'm going to plan. I'm going to have discipline. I'm going to have fun. I'm going to show love. He was the first person who led Michael in prayer. He was the first person who led Michael in prayer. So there was a spiritual side to him too.
But I think the role of grandparents is you're in the game or not, and really, quite frankly, it's just two decisions. Do I want to be in the game? If I want to be in the game, i.e., I want to be a good grandparent, what level of commitment, what level of money, and what am I going to try to teach my grandchildren? It's all in the paper. Not complicated. Make it simple. That's, that, I, I should tell you, just an aside, when I do these talks, I tape them on my, uh, my Mac and then listen to them in the car. And so sometimes I have to rewrite a section four or five times to just comp make it simple so I can understand it. Because, of course, if I can't understand it, God, what would you people do? I think the role of grandparents is to understand clearly they're not the disciplinarian. They are not meant to be Noah's money bags. God bless my grandmother. I think of her, and the first thing that comes to mind is $5 bill. Every time I saw her, that's what she gave me. When I think of my other grandmother, every time I think of her is the lesson she gave me of not cleaning up the kitchen when I went home for school one day and had hot dogs and left everything out on the stove. I did turn the stove off. But you know what? Which message do you think is more important? Obviously, cleaning up the hot dogs. So I think it's important that grandparents, there's a lot of material in the paper um, of the role of grandparents, but I think you're in a unique role. I think you have an extraordinarily important role to play. And I think it really just comes back to understanding what your role is and what your plans are. Now, we don't have many grandchildren, so I'm going to skip over this pretty quickly. But the, what I would say to grandchildren, and I would encourage parents and grandparents at an early age to organize your finances. I think it's so important that, uh, you know, obviously I'm in the wealth management business. I can tell you there have been studies done where multiple million dollar families, it's gone by the third generation 70% of the time. And it's gone with a big mess. Like it, it's not just a quiet, the money's gone. No, there's divorce and there's, you know, lawsuits going back and forth. There's a lifestyle entitlement, et cetera, that they can't possibly afford. Obviously there are families that do it quite well, but there are many that just don't. And I think it's because they really just don't understand. Um, I, I was meeting with a client and, you know, th all this stuff I talk about, these are hot buttons for clients. I mean, when you're, uh, these are hot buttons. Like, if we've got money, like, what are we going to do with it? Who are we going to get, you know, how are we going to, how do we get there? And she was going to leave X dollars for each one of her grandchildren. I said, oh, no, far too much. Um, and you've got to tear it. And you've got to start teaching them now. And I'm going to give you some ideas in a minute. And the second one is get involved in philanthropy for your grandchildren, whatever way. I mean, I like the, the allowance principle, a third, a third, a third. A third savings, a third consumption, a third philanthropy. Whether you do it in piggy banks, it doesn't matter. Three jars. I was actually at McDonald's waiting. I get pretty passionate about this stuff. Father was there. I said, good for you bringing your kid out. And we were talking, and I said, you know, I, I forget how it came about. But he said, no, we've got three jars at home. A third, a third, a third. I said, hey, you've read one of my papers. No, nah, I took it from somebody else. But... I think it's a great way at a young age to start. I think it really is. And, you know, somebody said to me, who's in fundraising, you can tell which families have sown into their DNA philanthropy and which ones haven't. And the reality is by the time they get 20, if they have not been exposed to it, it's very difficult to sow it in. It, it's something that it just won't come. It's either in your DNA by then or it's not. And then the last one is for the grandchildren, and I say this to the grandparents because you might have to initiate it, Ask your grandparents if they would agree to be interviewed by you. Now, there's a novel thought. In other words, ask your grandparents some of these questions. What was your biggest success in life? What did you learn from it? What was your biggest failure in life? What did you learn from it? What were and are your skills? What are your core values, mom, grandmom and granddad? What are your three core values? Now. A lot of people haven't thought of these things, okay? So you better start scrambling. But you know what? I will tell you, this is where the true blessing comes. This is where the true blessing comes. Ted, my second son, Mr. Kick, very outgoing guy. You know, at second year university, he was sort of trying to figure out what he was doing. He, uh, he came to me and said, Dad, you know, I've been talking to some inter interesting people about career paths and just trying to figure out where he goes. And you, you know, you can get as much from an interview if, if you don't want to do it and if you want to do it. It sort of starts to narrow down the, uh, the range of jobs that you're looking at. Anyways, to make a long story short, I said, well, Dad, uh, Ted, why don't you take Granddad out for dinner? Of course, knowing that Granddad would pay dinner. And he said, Granddad? Why would I go out with Granddad? I said, well, Ted, you know, he's president of Eaton Bay Financial and you, know, he did, and you don't have to be president, by the way. I mean, that just happened to be his job. 
And he said, oh, oh, I never knew that. Well, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll do that. So off to the keg they went. And you never go wrong with the keg, let me tell you as a parent. You can never go wrong with the keg. Um, he came back, he said, Dad, that was awesome. Granddad shared with me his values, his dreams. He shared with me when he graduated in 1946 and got a $500 scholarship. And, and uh, he took the $500 and put it down to join Rosedale Golf Club. <laughs> Everybody wanted him to buy books. He said, no, I'm going to join a golf club. <laughs> in other words, don't take life too seriously. Unfortunately, Dad passed away six months later, and Ted spoke at, his, uh, at a breakfast we had just before Dad did pass away, and he said, you know, my greatest regret is nobody else got the same opportunity. And I would just encourage the grandchildren, and since we've got mostly grandparents here, to take that opportunity. Take that opportunity because it gives you a chance to really show who you are. You know, there's a, a saying, I used it in the Tale of Two Cities, that when we pass away and if we choose the root of a tombstone, our name will be on the tombstone, two numbers, the day we were born, the day we died, and perhaps a message about who we were. But the real message is in the dash, the dash between the two numbers. The dash summarizes everything you were, everything you believed in, what you stood for, what you fought for, and most importantly, what you will be remembered for. And the way I put it is, what will that dash mean to your grandchildren? The next one is gifts for the grandparents. And if there's any grandchildren here, we're just about to get to the good part because I'm going to show you five ways to spend your grandparents' money. So, dreams require imagination, goals require inspiration, plans require perspiration. It's no more complicated than that. The reality is a goal without a plan will remain but a dream. Let me say it again. A goal without a plan will remain but a dream. You've got to have plans. And you've got to have the, the discipline to carry them out, but that's a whole other story. So there's three I discussed in there. The two I want to discuss here, first of all, begin the generational transfer of wealth. The biggest mistake I see done with most families is they wait till the lawyer's office, i.e. they've passed away and the will has been read. Let me tell you, if you have a dysfunctional family going into that reading, it's like pouring gas on the fire. I've seen people bring in their own lawyers to have their father's will read. Now, isn't that tragic? So start it now. At least you can find out what's working and what's not working. And the first one is, I call it the bank account. I suggested this to parents and I will suggest it to grandparents. Take your grandson or granddaughter out for a lunch, just the two of you, plus the granddaughter or grandson, i.e. papa and mama, grand grandpa and grandma rather, and say, we want to open a bank account in your name we're going to go over, just as an aside, Bank of Montreal to the end of April. If you open an account for a youngster, we'll give you $25 free and gratis. There's probably a hook that you have to keep it there for a year, but my point is, why not put $25 of your money plus $25 of Bank of Montreal's money to work? I'm, by the way, I'm not getting paid by Bank of Montreal. I deal with the commerce, just so we don't have any conflict here. But you then say to your grandchild, look, you know, we like to come back every year on this date, so maybe it's their birthday, maybe it's a special occasion, maybe it's Christmas, whatever works. And whatever you have saved over the previous year, we'll give you 50% bonus or a 25% bonus. Let's do 50 because it's an easy number and I'm very good at giving away other people's money. So if they save $20, they get a $10 bonus. If that $50 is only 25, they get no bonus and there's a carryover until they get their 25 back in, there's no more bonuses. In other words, put, make sure it's a game that they can understand. Delayed versus immediate gratification. I did this for all three of my boys. By the time they got to 16, they had $2,000 each, give or take. Money was irrelevant. Money was irrelevant. What they learned on the journey, budgeting, discipline, managing your expenses, you know, consumption now versus delayed gratification. All those things, so, so important. 16 birthday present. Now, again, this might not fit for grandparents, but you can think about it. When my kids got to 16, I said, here's a check for $1,000. You can do whatever you want with it. However, if you put it in the McLean button, where I work, into one of the mutual funds, which I hate to say I put in the U.S. equity fund, which is the worst one I could have chosen. However, having said that, on their 17th birthday, if you have not touched the money, you will get another check for $1,000. And this process will continue for the first five years. So you could get up to five $1,000 checks. I should tell you, I told the story with one of our private client groups and one of my best friends put his hand up and said, are you looking for any more kids? <laughs> um, 
Again, if they take any money out, it's entirely theirs to take out, but the checks stop. On their 20th birthday through 25th, nothing happens, and if they still have not touched the money, Laurel and I will match what is in that account. So what am I possibly giving away? Ten to $15,000 when they turn 25, hopefully graduated from university, starting to perhaps start a family, or at least getting off, being themselves independent, maybe even buying a house. You're just moving some of the money now. RESPs, Registered Educational Savings Plans, one of the greatest gifts from the Canadian government. You can contribute up to $5,000 per child per year. The first $2,500 gets a 20% grant from the Canadian government. Now, in today's interest rates, where they're paying you maybe 1%, there's not many 20%s kicking around. And this is risk-free. You know, go talk to your own professional advisor, but you can move it around. It could be, you know, Jack has made a contribution every year to his RESP. And Michael has used that, and Teddy and Blair, to fulfill their education plans. So, you know, you, you don't have to spend it on the actual child. You can actually, if all four of them decide not to go to university, um, you can move it into an RSP. But again, check with your professional advisor on that. But RESPs, the only word of caution, before you sort of march in with your checks, if you're so inclined to do so, I would talk to the parents, like your son or daughter, which is probably your motivation. I would also talk to the in-laws, because maybe they have the same plan, and you don't want this to be a competition. Usually it doesn't work that way, but if it works, I mean, wouldn't that be awful? I mean, you both have good, loving hearts, and then you're competing who's 2,500 gets the grant, and who's doesn't, and all that. I mean, talk about missing the whole party. Tax-free savings accounts. When my father passed away in 1980, uh, sorry, 2007, uh, I suggested to my brother and sister, and we approached my mother, there was nine grandchildren, all boys, I think seven of them or six of them were over the age of 18, so three were still under 18, that my mother every Christmas give a certain amount of money to each grandchild to put into a tax-free savings account. And we have done that for three straight years. You're starting, so she gets to see some of the blessing of doing it. Now, just like that $1,000 a year for the first five years, there was a hook. The hook was if you took the money out without your parents' approval, uh, or without your parents' blessing, because the approval would have been not, not the issue, I don't think. Um, the next contribution would be half of what it was the previous year and then half again. So it's up to you. In other words, if you want to just take this tax-free savings account money that your grandmother's given you and use it for beer money at university, you'll get to do that once. And then it'll start costing you. So I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think you can practice tough love when it comes to money. For heaven's sakes, our corporations do, our employers do. Why can't you do it with your grandchildren? You must do it. You must do that. And then the last one's a new one that I've just come up with. And I'll be honest, I've never really done this with my kids. But if I had uh, kids sort of 6, 8, and 10, I would sure do it right now. And that's called practicing philanthropy as a family. Grandparents, approach your granddaughter or your grandson and say, I want to give you a unique gift this year for your birthday. We're going to give you $100. And we're going to ask you to tell us what charity you would like that to go to. And we would like you to come and make a presentation to us why you selected that charity. So whatever charity they, and you've and you got to have an open mind here, as long as it's a legitimate charity, but it might not be right where your heart is, don't lose sight. That's not the point here. The point is teaching the grandchildren the importance of philanthropy. It's not that they give it to the, you know, the, the San Diego Zoo versus the Winnipeg Zoo. You know, you're a Canadian. You might not get a tax receipt for the San Diego Zoo, but that's a whole other issue. I, I think the point is you're taking the time. That's the, the biggest issue. You're taking the time. And um, the last gift that the grandparents can give is a set of series of talks by this, one of these gentlemen I talked about early, earlier, Jim Rohn. Jim Rohn is a, uh, unfortunately passed away in 2009. He was what I call a side door Christian. If you listen to a series of lectures he did called The Art of Exceptional Living, in Blair and especially Ted's case, they were life changing. Now, there was a lot of other parts. His mother was praying for them. There was a lot of Christianity. But this played an important part. And if you don't think that's the case, I want to share with you part of Ted's Waterloo application that he wrote in 2006. 
And here's what he wrote in the other section. You know, any other comments you want to add? The true turning point came from a series of lectures by Jim Rohn. I learned to work harder on my life than I do at school. This has become the philosophy of my life. I have become less focused on marks in school and more focused on life. I am not the golden student who spends vast number of hours on homework every night. I have the gift and practice of being able to master my subjects in a small amount of time and so appropriately spend time in other areas such as reading. I realize that this philosophy I have adopted is somewhat radical for a person of my age, but I feel it is crucial to my success. I always remember a formal education will make me a living, self-education will make me a fortune. Now, there was no sour grapes. In grade 10, Ted stood first in his year. And that's 94 kids, and he stood first. But that was life-changing. So that's what I'm saying. You're not, it's sort of like a friend of mine's going through cancer, and he says it's, it, the key in this thing, for him at least, is getting the right cocktail, getting the right mix of drugs to deal with it. I think it's the same thing with kids. I mean, this might not make any impact, but I'll tell you, in Ted's case and Blair's case, it was life-changing. So it's in the paper. If you want to get it, I don't get any royalties on it. I would suggest you buy it. And then I just want to conclude with achieving significance, leaving a legacy. The only place success comes ahead of work is in the dictionary, my father, Bill Livingston. I heard that probably at age four and heard it for the next, I can't remember how many years, probably until he died. It's a basic statement. It's a work ethic is important. We're all given a certain set of skills but we're supposed to use them. And it's too easy just to not use the skills you've been given. And so you have to work at it. You won't be successful at whatever you do unless you work at it. I don't believe. Now, I know that goes against Christian doctrine. But that part I know. But in, you know, your career, I mean, I'll say it as a husband. If you don't think you have to work at it, you're a fool. Of course you. And a wife has to work at it. Right? So you, the only place success comes ahead of work. Let me read something to you just to finish what my son Michael wrote his grandfather. It's just part of the letter. Who is my grandfather? He is many things to many people. My grandfather is a family man and a loving supporter. He takes me to my first hockey game where, strangely, a game puck flies off the ice and lands in my pizza box, becoming a keepsake for many years to come. He is the proper gentleman who meets my girlfriend for the first time with a twinkle in his eye, helping her with her coat and offering a gentle kiss on her cheek. He looks at me knowingly. Take your time, son. Take your time. Above all, my grandfather is a good man who bears good fruit. No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. The good man brings good things out of the good stored in his heart. The thorn bushes and briars may wither and burn, but in my grandfather there is a vine that endures. He is my friend, my mentor, and one of the finest examples how to share the good stored within. He pours hope and support into my future and guides me towards that which is admirable and pure. Now, I hope I'm not reading this to be self-serving. I've actually tried to ask myself that. I'm really doing it to encourage you as grandparents. Like, how could you not want something like that? What a legacy to leave. And, you know, and I look at it and I said, my father, despite where he was at the time when he received that, the love that he would have had for his grandson, the love Michael showed his grandfather, and I got to get both ends of, the, of it, right? I got to see Michael this way and Dad this way. And, you know, it works. It works. That's the key message. If you're prepared to spend the time, you're not going to get a 99% bat rate. But, you know, in this field, I take 90. I take 90 and run with it. That's a 99, by the way. So thank you. There comes a moment when my heart must stand alone On this lonely path I've chosen 